Good morning. We find ourselves in this familiar place again, and yet at the same time, we just want to welcome you to our time of worship and uh, praising God this morning. I want you to begin with me as we go to God in prayer. Father, we just want to lift you up today. We know that uh, these are trying times in many ways, and yet you just continue to bless us and bless us again and again. One of those blessings is having this privilege of being able to come together and to worship and to praise, to reflect upon the enormous sacrifice that has been made that gives us this avenue of prayer and gives us the privilege of being able to be called your children. Be with us this day as we are assembled together even from uh, many, many different locations, and yet our hearts and our spirits are joining together at this time for this time of worship. So Jesus, we pray. Amen. I praise you, O oh God, you are my God, and I will I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Oh God, you are my God, and I I will seek you in the morning. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you. All of my days, and step by step you lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Good morning, church. This first day of the week is indeed a, a grand circumstance for us. <clears throat> When I was thinking of what I would say today, the first thought that came to my mind was, why are we here? And it's a larger question perhaps than some of us think. In the beginning, when God said, let us make man in our image, and we were because God is an eternal spirit, we were given an eternal soul. And in our earthly role here, we succumbed to the lie of Satan and uh, alienated ourselves through sin from the eternal nature that was within us. but God loved us anyway. We are his creation. He keeps on loving us. Because of that love, he established a plan whereby we were able to be redeemed back to him through Christ Jesus. And because God and Christ are one and are of one mind, Christ understood the nature of the plan that he was going to be the perfect sacrificial lamb that would be given for our sins and bring us back to, Christ, back to God. 
He had a compelling love to do that. And uh, the word compelling struck in my mind. Compelling is described by Webster as demanding or holding one's attention, tending to convince or convert by, or as if by forcefulness of evidence. Christ had that compelling love. He understood that God's plan was the foremost circumstance of creation of eternity. The synonyms of compelling are cogent, conclusive, convincing, decisive, persuasive, satisfying, and strong. Do we think Christ was satisfied with his effort and his sacrifice here when he said on the cross, it is finished? I believe certainly that he was. And we're gathered this morning as God's saints to remember the death and resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and 1 Corinthians 11, we have recorded Christ establishing his memorial for us and his command, do this in remembrance of me. We are convinced by forceful, decisive evidence and our love for Christ and his willing sacrifice of his life for us that we participate as he said, do this in remembrance of me. Pray with me, please. Most Holy Father, we come to you this first day in awe of your love for us, Father, and the willingness of your Son to sacrifice himself that we could be redeemed back to you. Father, his body was so terribly abused in the hours before he was put to death on the cross. He asked us to remember that that uh, that torture that he went through. He gave the unleavened bread as the remembrant, remembrance of that. And Father, as we partake of this bread, we ask that you bless it and help us to remember the terrible, terrible circumstances of the, the cross. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Father, we continue our prayer to you in gratitude and in, in reverence and awe of the love and the power that you have, the power that brought Christ to us and the power that took him back to you and the power, Father, that will one day bring us back to you. The blood that he shed was the atoning sacrifice that gives us that opportunity and that right as your children. Father, we partake of this fruit of the vine, which he said was his blood. May we partake of it in a way that's acceptable to you and an edification for us. These things in Christ's name. Amen. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come?
Are you ready for a word from God this morning? I want to bring out today two very important qualities that we need to possess, that we need to emulate, that we find in the life of our Lord. You know, when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, you, uh, you are struck by many, many things that just stand out. Certainly, His miracles stand out his powerful teaching where he taught like none other Uh, no one had ever heard anything like his teaching and it may be true that we do not have the kind of power that jesus displayed in order to do the miracles that he did and we don't have the authority to preach and to teach in the same way that he did. We certainly have that authority that comes to us through God's Word, but as far as being able to do it in such a way that it's like no one has has ever heard, we're probably limited in our ability to uh, copy that and to display that. However, there are a couple of other qualities and two that I want to deal with this morning that we certainly can make as a part of our life and our approach 
in relationships and we all know that is going to be very important and needed in connection with people today. And the two that I'm referring to are compassion and gentleness. When you look at the life of Jesus, those qualities just jump off the pages of his life. If you think about some stories that I want to relate to you, most of these are going to be familiar to you. A couple of them, a few of them at least, come out of the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 5, in verses 12 through 16, we find Jesus dealing with a man who was stricken with leprosy. In verse 13 of Luke chapter 5, it says that Jesus reaches out and touches the man and cleanses him of that leprosy. A couple of chapters later in Luke chapter 7, Jesus and his disciples are entering in to the city of Nain, and there is a funeral procession coming out of the city, and it was the funeral of a young boy, a son, the only son of a woman from Nain, and she was a widow on top of that. And in that very same section in Luke chapter 7 and verse 14, Jesus went over and he touched the boy and restored life back to him. And in both of these cases, we see Jesus is touching that which was deemed untouchable. And in many other places, uh, these accounts are given in uh, other gospel uh, messages, and, and it's told that he was motivated by his compassion. He was moved by his compassion. Still in Luke chapter 7, in verses 36 through 50, there is this story of a Pharisee, a religious leader, that has Jesus over for a feast. And in the midst of this party, a woman crashes the party. It was a woman of some bad reputation, uh, viewed upon by all as just a sinner and of no worth and of no value. Certainly in the eyes of this Pharisee, she was characterized that way. And yet in that very same context, Jesus would ask the Pharisee, do you even see this woman? And he winds up forgiving her because of her uh, faith and because of her heart that drove her to his feet. And so Jesus is moved with compassion in that case as well. And, and it's reminiscent of the compassion that he displayed to the woman of Samaria at the well, an outcast among all outcasts. And yet Jesus offers her that water of life in John chapter 4. Reminiscent of the compassion that Jesus showed the adulterous woman that was brought to him at the temple and thrown at his feet to be stoned. And yet again, Jesus is motivated by his compassion for her and shows her the grace of not condemning her, but challenging her to go and leave that life of sin. You look in Matthew's account, and in Matthew chapter 8, there are just numbers of stories, again, of the healing of the leper. There's the story of the centurion that comes to Jesus on behalf of his servant. There's the story of Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. In Matthew chapter 9, it goes on to tell many more stories of a paralyzed man that's brought before Jesus. And in the midst of uh, those stories, we find a synagogue leader that comes to Jesus on behalf of his daughter. In the midst of that story, there's a woman that has been bleeding for 12 years that finds her way to Jesus as well. On the heels of that, there's two blind men. There's one that was uh, a mute. And in verse 36 of Matthew chapter 9, it says, To all that were brought to him, to all the sick, he was moved with compassion. And so we just find such a compassionate spirit on the part of Jesus. You might remember that very same emotion being evoked 
in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus saw the multitudes, the crowds that were following after him, and just before he fed the 5,000, he was moved with compassion as he beheld them. Our word compassion comes from the Latin word compassio, and it simply means to suffer with. It talks about having that empathy, having that ability to understand the pain and the struggle that a person might find themselves going through. And it reminds me of the words of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, where the Hebrew writer says, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, and do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have even shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue, listen closely to verse 3, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. That's compassio, that's suffering with, that's being moved with compassion. And so in each one of these cases, uh, whether you're studying out of Luke 5 or Luke 7 or Matthew 8 or Matthew 9, you find Jesus constantly being moved to action with his compassion. And then right along with the compassion as a quality that we need to emulate and to display in our lives is that quality of gentleness. In Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus was extending that well-known, familiar invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, He talks about how He is meek and gentle, and we can find rest for our souls. And it's also in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 20, in the midst of His healing those that were in need, there is a quotation out of Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 3, and it's found in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 20, but I want to read from Isaiah's words in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And so you sense that gentle a spirit of Jesus, and you certainly see that gentle spirit in the way that he dealt with that party crasher in Luke chapter 7, with the way that he dealt with that widow who had lost her only son in Luke chapter 7, with the way that he dealt with that leper in Luke chapter 5, with the way that he dealt with that Samaritan woman in John 4, with the way that he dealt with the adulterous woman in John 8. And just again, every example the compassion and the gentle spirit is just so striking. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, he makes an appeal to them and he does so in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1 by the meekness and by the gentleness of Christ. Paul says, I appeal to you we find that gentleness listed among the fruit of the Spirit. And so a, a, a evidence that the Spirit is having its way with us is that it is manifested in our gentleness in dealing with others. I also love the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 4. After he tells us in verse 4 to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, he goes on in verse 5 to say this, Let your gentleness be evident to all. So this is something that is to be an obvious characteristic of who we are as God's children, as God's people, the gentle way that we deal with others. And then a passage that we've seen on many occasions in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. In your hearts you need to sanctify Christ as Lord. 
And you need to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give them a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. So even in our sharing our faith, we're to speak the truth with love. Even in our sharing the gospel message and giving that reason for the hope that we have, we're to do so with a gentle spirit and with a respect for the people that we are sharing our faith with. And so as you think about these qualities that Jesus displayed, it very well is the case that we don't have that supernatural, miraculous power to be able to give sight back to the blind or to heal the leper or to raise the dead. And it may very well be the case that we cannot teach in such a way that people fall back because of the power and the authority of our words. But it is certainly the case that we can be people of compassion who possess that compasio, who are able to suffer with other individuals. And certainly, once again, in this day and time, with all that's going on around us, there are so many opportunities to display that kind of compassion and then to be able to approach people with that gentle spirit. And so I'm thinking as, as we consider all the different connections out there in our life, whether we find ourselves having to deal with some first responders in some pretty intense situations, or perhaps we are uh, dealing with some medical staff, either through family members that are suffering or our own issues that we're having to deal with, and we recognize the pressures that uh, these medical uh, individuals are under. Perhaps it's something as simple as a waiter or a waitress that's also in some pretty high-pressured situations, not fully sure how they're going to be providing for their families and the uh, accommodations that are having to be made with uh, the restaurant industry and stores where cashiers are working under some pretty high pressured situations and checkers and stockers and sackers and tellers and just people in general that we come in contact with every day. Perhaps it's just a neighbor next door. Perhaps it's someone driving along the street with us. There are many, many opportunities that we can have as God's people to emulate, to display these two very important qualities as we think about relating to our fellow man. This has been important every day of our life, but perhaps it's not been any more important than today with all that's going on around us and with the fear and with the concern that's being displayed, and again, with some of the high-pressure situation that those around us find themselves in, they can use a truckload of compasio and that gentle spirit. I want to challenge you with uh, several things before we close out this morning. I want you to remember that our elders... Uh, stand ready and wanting to help if there's anything that's going on in your life. If you find yourself to be outside the body of Jesus Christ and you need to have some uh, study to know how to be saved, to know how to be placed in that right relationship with God, our elders would love that opportunity to be able to study with you. If you are a part of the body of Jesus Christ and yet uh, some of the stresses and pressures of the day has caused you to be weakened in your faith, these same godly men would welcome that opportunity to pray with you, to pray for you, to study with you, to give you those words of encouragement. It, uh, it could be any number of different things that you're going through in your life that our shepherds would be in a great position to be able to just bless your life and you can contact them directly or you can contact the church office and we can surely put you 
in contact with them. Another thing I want to uh, remind you of is uh, during this time when we are uh, shut down and are having to worship in this uh, kind of a way, the needs of the church just continue to go on. And so we want to remind you of the importance of uh, giving. If you're a part of the body of uh, Christ here at the Village Church of Christ, you're aware of all the many things that are happening and that we're doing. And so uh, at the close of our time together in just a few moments, there'll be a slide that appears that reminds you of the different alternatives that are available to you to continue on to fulfill uh, your grace of giving in this time. And the last thing I want to do is just share with you the blessing that God gave to His people found in Numbers chapter, 20, uh, Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Amen.